بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونشكره ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أما بعد Dear beloved brothers and sisters in Allah, in this series about our respected Muslim scholars, we introduce some of the greatest Muslim scholars. We speak of the scholars who fulfill the meaning of the verse in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Verily, the knowledgeable scholars of Islam are the ones that have taqwa, and the ones that are most mindful and most loving and most fearful and most praising of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If all we accomplish by reflecting on their lives and accomplishments of those great and influential imams of Islam, is to love them for the sake of Allah, then that would be enough. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, among the seven categories of the people, nevertheless, amongst the goal of this series also, and these lectures, number one, is to see how those scholars love Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. And because of their sincerity for this deen, they place the verse in the Quran and the hadith from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ before anyone's opinion, even themselves. And that is why, with the sincere scholars of Islam, they collectively say, if our opinion might seem to differ with the saying of the Prophet ﷺ, then don't hesitate to do away with it and follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The second reason, dear beloved brothers and sisters, is that if I have a heart surgery, for example, as much as I love you, as much as I love the Imam, as much as I love my father or mother, I'm only going to a heart surgeon to operate on my heart. SubhanAllah, when it comes to religion, however, we don't hesitate to ask anyone. Not a person or a scholar or a alim, but we don't hesitate to ask anyone. Or after reading a hadith or two, sometimes we think that we are scholars and we can give the verdict ourselves. We start our series with an Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi alayhi, an Imam whose great efforts and sacrifices earned him the title Al Imam Al Adam, the Grand Imam, and also Imam Al Muslimin the Imam and the leader of the Muslims in fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence. The grandfather of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi and Nu'man was a close friend of Amir al-Mu'min Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu arda. And Ali ibn Abi Talib prayed for Thabit, the father of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, that Allah bless him and bless and also place barakah in his offspring. The offspring of Thabit, Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, was born in the city of Al-Kufa in Iraq in the year 80 after the Hijrah, which corresponds to 1689 A.D. His name is Al-Nu'man <coughs> ibn Thabit ibn Al-Nu'man ibn Al-Marzub. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa ancestry is of Persian origin. Yet they have excelled in the knowledge of Islam and Arabic beyond most of the Muslim scholars, even from amongst the Arabs. A living proof of the verse in the Quran, Inna akramakum atqakum, Verily the most generous and the best amongst you is the one that possesses taqwa. And to those that claim their lack of seeking Islamic knowledge due to their limited knowledge of Arabic, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi is a role model along with many of the best of the Muslim scholars who through their dedicated and sincere efforts of studying the arts and sciences of Arabic and Islamic knowledge have excelled beyond others. The start of the journey. Before pursuing this great and blessed knowledge, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was one of the most successful businessmen in Al-Kufa. Dear beloved brothers and sisters, Al-Imam Al-Shabi was one of the greatest scholars of Islam, well known for having narrated so many hadith of the Prophet wasalam. And as Abu Hanifa would frequent the masjid to pray, Al-Imam Al-Shabi noticed the signs of brilliance and great intelligence ex exhibited in Abu Hanifa. Rahmatullahi alayhi. And so he asked him, إِلَى مَنْ تَخْتَلِفْ who amongst the Muslim scholars do you frequent and visit in hopes of pursuing the science of Islamic knowledge? Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi replied that I don't frequent scholars that much since I'm busy with my business. Al-Imam al-Shabi advised Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi that someone of your caliber, someone with your intelligence and someone of your dedication and motivation must frequent the scholars and dedicate their time and effort into seeking the knowledge of the arts and sciences of our beautiful religion. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi said that this advice from Al-Imam al-Shabi was a push for me that motivated me towards pursuing knowledge. And we extend this advice and invitation of Al-Imam al-Shabi to the Muslim businessman, the Muslim doctor, the Muslim imam, the Muslim engineer, the Muslim student, the Muslim worker, the Muslim employee, to dedicate among their work time for seriously and sincerely seeking and pursuing the knowledge of this deen. 
which brings nothing to their life but barakah and blessing, and nothing in the hereafter other than the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi said, فَوَقَعَ فِي قَلْبِي مِنْ قَوْلِهِ Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi said, that the advice of Imam al-Shabi touched my heart and I started my journey of frequenting the Muslim scholars and learning from them, and Allah greatly blessed me. Now we move to the scholars of Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi. To ensure the proper path of knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was dedicated to frequenting the Imams and scholars that were known and respected for their knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And fortunately for Al-Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, the city of Al-Kufa was filled with many of the greatest scholars which explains why Umar ibn al-Khattab and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhum would call the city of Al-Kufa Ra'as Ahl al-Islam, the head and front of the Muslim people. Due to the fact that in Al-Kufa lived many of the greatest scholars of Islam and knowledgeable and sincere Muslims. And Al-Kufa was a center of great Islamic knowledge and great civilization and genuine invention. This pursuit of knowledge and the drive of da'wah and sharing this great knowledge drove Al-Imam Abu Hanifa in many journeys. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa traveled leaving his business and many personal attachments and yet traveled to the city of Al-Basra for instance over 20 times. And at times he resided in Al-Basra for the duration of an entire year teaching and sharing the beautiful arts and sciences of Islamic studies. And Imam Abu Hanifa is reported to have performed Hajj 55 times. And he also dedicated his journeys of Hajj to meet with some of the other Muslim scholars who might have came from all around the world to further benefit as well as share the wealth and depth of arts and sciences of the teachings of our most beautiful, our beautiful religion. Thus Imam Abu Hanifa is a role model for the Muslims and the importance of taking the effort of pursuing knowledge even if it means visiting a faraway masjid where an imam of great knowledge is visiting or teaches, or even journeying to another city repeatedly. Abu Hanifa learned from many Muslim scholars who lived or visited Al-Kufa. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa is considered to be from the Tabi'een, since he was blessed by Allah to have sat before and learned directly from one of the greatest Sahaba companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and that is Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu arda. The Imam and instructor of Abu Hanifa, that is Anas ibn Malik, is one of the most knowledgeable Sahaba who lived more than a hundred years and died in the year 93 after the Hijrah. Anas ibn Malik spent some of his later years in Al-Kufa, teaching the Muslims in the Masjid, where Abu Hanifa learned and benefited enormously. When this Sahabi, this companion of the Prophet ﷺ, Anas ibn Malik, would speak in the Masjid, the Masjid would fill with the great number of Muslims who came to learn from a man who served and accompanied the Prophet ﷺ. And they would document his hadith and sayings that he reported and narrated about the Prophet ﷺ. Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu arda narrated 2,286 hadith and sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, which shows the depth of knowledge and closeness to the Prophet ﷺ. Imam Abu Hanifa also learned from many of the other tabi'een such as Hisham ibn Urwa ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam who is amongst his family as well as his uncle and grandfather were all from the Sahaba companions of Prophet ﷺ and also encountered many of the tabi'een another tabi'a with great exposure to the knowledge of the Sahaba from whom Imam Abu Hanifa learned was Nafi' Mawla Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab Thus Abu Hanifa is a role model to the Muslims in the importance of seeking the knowledge of Islam from its purest sources, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and frequenting and learning from the knowledgeable scholars and imams that are known for their adherence and accordance to the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Abu Hanifa also learned from a special, extraordinary group of scholars, Ahl al-Bayt, the scholars from amongst the descendants and bloodline of the Prophet ﷺ. Unlike every Muslim who prays for Ahl al-Bayt in Eid Salah in the Tashahud, Abu Hanifa had a special love, honor, and respect for the scholars of Ahl al-Bayt Among this elite group of scholars from whom Abu Hanifa has learned during his visits to Mecca and al-Madina were the great Imams, Al-Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, also Al-Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, also Imam Abdullah ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. May Allah be pleased with all of them, radiallahu anhum. All three of whom have gained so much knowledge of the arts and sciences of the scholarly study of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Three of whom were highly regarded and respected for that by the scholars and imams of the Muslims all over. And the narration of the hadith is narrated by scholars of hadith such as Imam Malik in the Muwatta, Imam Muslim in his book, Sahih Muslim. When we speak about the recitation of the Qur'an, such as the recitation of the Imam of the Haram, we say the Qira'a of Hafs and Asim, according to the recitation of Hafs as it was narrated by Asim. And Abu Hanifa learned and memorized the Qur'an directly before that Imam of the Qur'an and the sciences of the Qur'an, Al-Imam Asim, directly. 
Amongst attending the halaqa and lessons of many of the most knowledgeable imams and scholars, Al Imam Abu Hanifa dedicated most of his time in learning from one very knowledgeable and unique imam. From the beginning of this beautiful journey of seeking knowledge, Al Imam Abu Hanifa chose to frequent one of those great scholars of Al Kufa, an imam by the name of Hamad. For the next 18 years, Al Imam Abu Hanifa was to sit regularly before this great, wise, knowledgeable, and sincere imam, Al Imam Hamad. Al Imam Abu Hanifa describes his first impression of Hamad by saying, رأيت فيه علما عظيما. I have noticed that Al Imam Hamad possesses a great deal of knowledge. During those 18 continuous years, Al Imam Hamad enjoyed the presence of his student, Al Imam Abu Hanifa. And Al Imam Hamad noticed the great attention, motivation, and overwhelming ability of memorization of Al Imam Abu Hanifa. So he commanded that none of his students sit next to him during his lectures in the masjid, except for his outstanding student, Al Imam Abu Hanifa. The 18 years that Al Imam Abu Hanifa accompanied Al Imam Hamad showed a great and continued effort of Al Imam Abu Hanifa in pursuing knowledge. Also, the depth and great profoundness of the knowledge of Hamad, as Hamad was a scholar in the sciences of the Qur'an and its interpretation, the science of his hadith and its narration, its meaning and its implementation, the science of fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, the science of worship and ibadat, the science of Islamic financial and accounting matters, such as Muslim businesses, the laws of inheritance, the division of zakah, the implementation of Islamic business. Hamad also had great knowledge in the fields of Islamic law the implementation of Sharia in the Muslim court and judicial system. More importantly, Imam Abu Hanifa chose to learn from Hamad because Hamad was known to emphasize a great deal and learn a great deal of his knowledge from the Sahaba, the companions of Prophet ﷺ, especially those that were well known for their vast and immeasurable knowledge. The majority of the knowledge of Hamad is built on the knowledge of Umar ibn, Umar ibn Khattab, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Al Imam Abu Hanifa accompanied, learned, and greatly benefited from this magnificent Imam Hamad until the year 120 after the Hijrah, when Hamad died, rahmatullahi alayhi wa jazaallahu anil muslimina kulla Now we move to the school of Abu Hanifa. When Hamad died, Al Imam Abu Hanifa was 40 years of age, and at the age of wisdom, and with all of his pure and rich knowledge that he has possessed, Abu Hanifa sat in the masjid and led and taught the halaqa of his lifelong friend, teacher, and imam, Hamad, who has passed away. This was the start of one of the greatest Islamic institutions, the school of Imam Abu Hanifa, and the title of his school that he taught was Halaqat Abi Hamad. The halaqat in the masjids in Al-Kufa were known, or the circles of knowledge were known and respected, and their equivalent or even better than what is known today as universities. The halaqat weren't only the center of pursuing knowledge, but also building the character of the Muslim. Shortly after Abu Hanifa sat in the halaqa and school to teach in the masjid, the numbers of the Muslims attending his school increased to great and astonishing numbers. And more amazingly, as Abu Hanifa would travel to perform Hajj, when he would visit Mecca, for instance, and Medina, he would teach his school in Mecca, as the imams and scholars of Mecca have long known of him and his knowledge. And when Abu Hanifa visited al Medina, he would teach his school there. And during his several visits to al Medina, he would meet, visit, and exchange a great deal of knowledge with one of the greatest Imams of al Medina, and of the Muslim maker, and the Muslim Ummah altogether, Al Imam Malik. And in many of their discussions, that is the discussions of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, it was reported that Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik would agree on the same opinion. Until this day, some people might misunderstand the school of thought of Abu Hanifa, and it's worth mentioning, and that is in the matter of Qiyas. This could be summarized and clarified by a letter that was sent by the Khalifa Abu Jafar al-Mansur, in which he inquired directly to Imam Abu Hanifa. And he said to him in the letter, I have heard that you place Ijtihad and Qiyas, that is logical opinion and comparative deduction before the hadith and sayings of the Prophet Is that true? Al Imam Abu Hanifa replied, ليس الأمر كذلك. That is not the case. First and foremost, I start with the Quran, then the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, then I follow the verdicts of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali radiAllahu anhum. And if it is not yet found, then I search for the opinion of other Sahaba radiAllahu anhum. And if after all of that I don't find, I make the Qiyas, which is based on the teachings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And that was commanded by the Prophet والسلام, and that is what Umar ibn Khattab did. A very beautiful clarification from Imam Abu Hanifa. 
Interestingly, many of the scholars and pioneers of the other school of thought, the school of thought of naql and ethar, narration, had criticisms of the school of thought of opinion and logical deduction to which Abu Hanifa subscribed, but yet they had the utmost respect for Imam Abu Hanifa, his knowledge, his ability to explain and implement the verses of the Qur'an and the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Those Imams of the school of thought of narration that spoke highly of him included Imam Sufyan al-Thawri and also Imam Muhammad ibn Ali, Zayn al-Abidin, ibn al-Husayn, ibn Ali, ibn Abi Talib who at one instance stood up and hugged the Imam Abu Hanifa out of respect for his knowledge and love for the Qur'an. And so let us look at what some of the greatest ulama from both school of thoughts have said about him. Abdullah ibn Mubarak describes Abu Hanifa by saying, مِنْ أَكْبَرِ عُلَمَاءَ زَمَانِ مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا تَكَلَّمَ فِي الْفِقْءِ خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَبِي Hanifa. Abdullah ibn Mubarak describes Abu Hanifa by saying, Abu Hanifa is amongst the greatest and most knowledgeable scholars and imams of his time. I have never seen a man more knowledgeable in the arts and sciences of fiqh than Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad describes Abu Hanifa by saying, Abu Hanifa was a man of great knowledge of fiqh, and he was known and recognized for his humbleness. Abu Hanifa was also a very wealthy man as was, and was generous to everyone that approached him. Abu Hanifa was persistent on teaching and sharing knowledge where it was daytime or nighttime. Abu Hanifa was known for his long prayers at night and was also a very quiet, reflecting person. But when a matter was presented concerning haram and halal, he never hesitated to guide towards the truth and he stayed far away from the money of the Sultan. All of this is what Fudayl ibn Iyad said about him. As Abu Hanifa visited al madid al-Munawwara and visited with Imam Malik, Imam Malik showed great love and respect for Abu Hanifa. And they, in many of their discussions, agreed on their verdicts. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said about Abu Hanifa, may Allah reward Imam Abu Hanifa for his brilliant efforts in the arts and sciences of Islamic knowledge. Now let us move to the next subject and that is the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa treated his students with utmost respect and made himself and resources available to them in magnificent ways. To name and focus on a few of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa who amongst many later became great Imams themselves are Abu Yusuf, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani and Zufar ibn al-Huzayl. Abu Yusuf, whose full name is Yaqub ibn Ibrahim, was assigned by Abu Hanifa to write and document their discussion and arguments raised in the sessions of the school of Imam Abu Hanifa. And the added attention that Abu Hanifa had for his students is what made them excel. Until Abu Yusuf, this brilliant student of Abu Hanifa, was later appointed by the Khalifa Harun al-Rashid to be Qadi lil Quda, the Supreme Judge. The students of Abu Hanifa didn't only learn the arts and sciences of our most beautiful and rich deen and religion, but they first learned from him the character of the Muslim, which he lived himself. And actions speak much louder than words. In addition to that, the love and care that Abu Hanifa had for his students was evident in many including as Abu Hanifa was reported to have said, By Allah, I always pray for everyone that has taught me something, and I always pray for anyone that I have taught something to. Many of the students of this rich and pure school of Abu Hanifa were to be governors of Muslim states and the head of officials at Muslim offices. People admired and respected the students of Imam Abu Hanifa as they knew the wealth and knowledge and beautiful Muslim character to expect from them. Now to see the depth of the knowledge of Imam Abu Hanifa and his students, let us look at some of the writings of them. Imam Abu Hanifa has left behind not only outstanding students, who were to be the leaders of yani, Imams and Muslims for years and years to come, but he also left a wealth of writings, some directly written by him and others documented by his students. Not to name all, but some of the most famous books and writings of whom Imam Abu Hanifa is responsible and included yani, his works. Number one, al mabsut Number two, al ziyadah Number three, al jami al sagir Number four, al siyar al sagir Number five, al jami al kabir Number six, al siyar al kabir al mabsut one of those books, was later revised into a marvelous collection of books, a 30-volume encyclopedia, which until today is the source and best explanation of the madhab and collection of research and verdicts of Imam Abu Hanifa. Also, uh, number seven, Kitab al-Salah, the Book of Salah. Number eight, Kitab al-Zakah, Kitab al-Siyam, Kitab al-Fara'id, that's the Book of Inheritance, the Book of Islamic Jurisprudence and Judicial System, the Book of Financial Dealings, Kitab al-Buyu', Kitab al-Wasaya, Kitab al-Wakala, Kitab al-Sayyid, 
the book of slaughtering, hunting and Islamic dietary guidelines and the Imam Muhaif and his students have left very precious books and many others and when the Tatar invaded the area many more of the wealth of those Imams was lost unfortunately. Nevertheless, it is the sincerity of the great Imam Abu Hanifa, his very dedicated students, who later became great Imams, leaders themselves, and wonderful writings that have resulted in the spread of his madhab and people accepting it with love and respect. Now we move to the business of Abu Hanifa. The Prophet ﷺ says in hadith, نعم المام الصالح للعبد الصالح In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ praises the wealthy Muslim who earned his wealth from halal and spends it in halal. Abu Hanifa was a true fulfillment of this wealthy Muslim whose wealth was earned from halal and was spent in halal. And his wealth was not a distraction for him, but a means for him to get closer to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To all of the Muslim business persons, the Muslim engineers, the Muslim doctors, the Muslim employees, and the Muslim scholars, let's examine and learn from the beautiful balance that this Imam had between his work and his religious responsibility as an Imam. The prophets of this successful and blessed business of Abu Hanifa would first go to the needy and poor amongst his students, then the poor from the public, and then his family and household. From the prophets of his business, Abu Hanifa had monthly salary that he paid for the poor and needy amongst his students, so that they can continue their path of seeking knowledge. For instance, Abu Hanifa used to pay nafaqa to one of his most brilliant students, Abi Yusuf, and the family of Abi Yusuf for 20 continuous years. And the fruits of supporting this brilliant student was evident, as in the case of Abi Yusuf, who was appointed by the Khalifa Harun al-Rashid, Qadiyan lil Quda, the Supreme Judge, or in today's terms, the Minister of Justice. People admired and respected the students of Imam Abu Hanifa as they knew the wealth and knowledge and beautiful Muslim character to expect from them. Abu Hanifa and his strong political stand. Imam Abu Hanifa was a man whose taqwa and knowledge had raised him to point of respect before all people, even the Sultan of Khalifa, who wanted to appoint him to a variety of posts and offices. Having an Imam such as Abu Hanifa supporting the Khalifa, the leader, would show much respect and honor before people to such a leadership. But Abu Hanifa, out of sincerity and fear of Allah, never accepted any offices in government or any money or gift from the Khalifa. The rumor then spread amongst the people that Abu Hanifa did not accept any post or office in the government due to his opposition to their injustices. The Khalifa, the leader of the state, then insisted that Abu Hanifa had to show his support to the government by accepting any office. That Abu Hanifa's piety and taqwa and sincerity would not allow him to accept any benefit in dunya in this world as a price of his scholarly knowledge. And SubhanAllah, Ibn Ghubayrah, the governor, took Abu Hanifa to a place called al Kanafa, and for 10 days Abu Hanifa was lashed and persecuted. Not for a mistake that he did, but just to accept any office in government. Yet this great Imam never for one moment was weakened. Al Imam Abu Hanifa stood in the path of advising the leadership and correcting them and warning them from committing any aggression until they feared him to the extent that they later on also imprisoned him. SubhanAllah, this great Imam was to live his last days in prison and died, rahmatullah alayhi, in jail. Where some people claim that he might have been poisoned, only Allah knows if that was the case, but we mention that since it is documented historically as a possibility. Al Imam Abu Hanifa died and returned to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Rajab of the year 150 Hijri. As we are rushing to grab posts and titles, let us remember that they are a test. And with the sincerity of Abu Hanifa, remember that we would be asked as husbands, as wives, as teachers, as board members, as imams. We will be asked before Allah on the Day of Judgment on that. Again, Abu Hanifa would not accept gifts and money from the Khalifa, the ruler. And when he was asked by the Khalifa, why wouldn't he accept it? With much iman and strength, Abu Hanifa said to the ruler, If your gift was from your personal money, then I might accept it. But you are spending the money of the believers in Bayt al-Man, Bayt al muslimin of which I am not worthy, and you would be asked about. SubhanAllah, such iman and strength exhibited by this iman. However, there was one time when an interesting gift was offered to Abu Hanifa from the house of the Khalifa, but from different money. The Khalifa, the ruler, Al-Mansur, had a dispute with his wife, and he told her to ask any imam that she wishes to judge. So she requested the presence of Abu Hanifa. 
So Abu Hanifa was invited to the ruler's palace where he was welcomed and honored. At this point, Abu Hanifa still had no idea what the question or dispute was about. At the presence of his wife, the ruler of Khalifa al-Mansur asked Abu Hanifa, Isn't it permissible for a man to marry more than one wife? From the question, it becomes apparent what the dispute was. No one of the Khalifa and his wife had a great dispute. So the Khalifa asked Abu Hanifa, Isn't it permissible for a man to marry more than one wife? Abu Hanifa replied, Yes. The Khalifa then replied to Abu Hanifa, this is all we wanted to know from you. Abu Hanifa then added with very much iman and strength and power. However, this is only permissible for the believer that possesses the quality of justice and equality and has knowledge. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَن تَعْدِلُوا بَيْنَ النِّسَاءِ وَلَوْ حَرَصْتُمْ فَلَا تَمِيلُوا كُلَّ الْمَيْنِ Marrying more than one woman is only permissible for the believer that possesses the quality of justice and equality and has knowledge. You are a man of great injustice and equality. SubhanAllah, in front of the Khalifa, who ran the Muslim state extending countries and countries, whose armies with one command move across lands, Abu Hanifa didn't hesitate to speak with power. Allah Akbar. So upon returning home, a man came to the house of Abu Hanifa with a lot of money and gifts, and Abu Hanifa wondered, where did all of those luxurious gifts come from? The man replied, this is a gift from the wife of the Khalifa. She is very pleased with your verdict. Dear beloved brothers and sisters, one thing that you will find in Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi is not only the character of the Muslim and the depth of knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and putting that before anyone's opinion as he has taught that himself that if he ever gave a verdict, Abu Hanifa says the meaning of which if I ever give a verdict and you find a verse from the Qur'an or hadith from the Sunnah or the saying of the Sahabi saying otherwise then that is what your source is. But in addition to all of this depth and wealth of knowledge of Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi alayhi, we also find something that was a very beautiful character in him, and that is his wisdom and sense of humor. In matters as complex as, as, complex as aqeedah and tawheed and matters of faith and belief, uh, that a lot of people might get very angry and, uh, and lose yani, uh, the, uh, their sources. Imam Abu Hanifa was very confident, very wise, and very humorous actually in the way he approached this matter. And that is why his discussion with the Khawarij was very famous. And in all of his discussions, he was victorious, mashallah. For example, let us take a group who spoke against the Sahaba. Abu Hanifa once heard of a man who criticized Amir al-Mu'minin Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu arba, one of the greatest Sahaba. The man transgressed, yani, transgressed to the point of saying that Uthman ibn Affan was not a Muslim and was actually a Jew. Abu Hanifa insisted in visiting this man and asked him, I have a very good brother who wants to marry your daughter. This man prays, fasts, performs hajj. The man said, MashaAllah, my daughter and I would be very pleased with such a man. Abu Hanifa said, but there is one problem. The man is not a Muslim. That man is a Jew. The man immediately said, are you crazy Abu Hanifa? This is haram. My daughter cannot marry a non-Muslim. Abu Hanifa said, well, would the Prophet والسلام, allow his daughter to marry a non-Muslim? Brothers and sisters, this is because Uthman ibn Affan married the daughter of the Prophet والسلام. Immediately the man apologized for his mistake and said, I would never insult any of the Sahaba. In this example, we learn from Abu Hanifa that when we win, yani we win our arguments, and more importantly, the hearts of the people, not by shouting and screaming and cursing, but knowledgeable, respectful and humorous discussion. Another interesting example amongst the wisdom and humor of Abu Hanifa was an incident in which his mother made an oath and did not fulfill her oath. So she asked her son Abu Hanifa, and she did not accept his answer. SubhanAllah, in the eyes of the parents, the son and daughter are always young. So she said to Abu Hanifa to take her to Imam so-and-so. This Imam actually was one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. But because he was much older in age, his mother wanted to ask him. So when Abu Hanifa and his mother arrived before this man, she asked the man for his verdict. And the man was shocked. Here is the mother of Abu Hanifa with her son, one of the greatest imams ever. And so the man asked Abu Hanifa, what is the verdict in this matter? Abu Hanifa replied to him. And the man replied to the mother of Abu Hanifa with the same reply of her son. And now the mother of Abu Hanifa returned yani, home happy and pleased. This shows how yani, we need to be gentle and sensitive, especially to our parents. Unfortunately, sometimes 
And you see Muslims you know, run to conclusions with their parents, run, uh, rushing to say things uh, to their elders, this is haram, you don't know, you are ignorant, and this and that. But we learn again from Abu Hanifa the importance of respect and honoring our elders in our da'wah and speaking to them. Also in the path of da'wah, one story that is very interesting that uh, was between Abu Hanifa and his neighbor. Abu Hanifa subhanAllah was spent his night in qiyam and prayer before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his, in his house. And his next door neighbor was a man that worked a very tough, and you know, he had a very tough occupation and he would come back, a younger, uh, a youthful person, a younger uh, man. And he would come back at the end of the day very tired. And in his house, in his own privacy, the person would, would drink liquor. And when he drinks, he starts to scream and sing in a very loud voice, أَضَعُونِ وَأَيَّثَةً أَضَعُونِ The meaning of which, uh, they, they have wasted me and I am a wonderful and great person. All night repeating it over and over. And people do not recognize me. They have wasted me and I'm a wonderful person. So imagine every night here is Abu Hanifa spending his night in prayer before Allah. And here is the neighbor drinking in the privacy of his own place and screaming, They have wasted me. Uh, what a wonderful person I am. Until one day, subhanAllah, Imam Abu Hanifa stood up to pray his night prayer and he did not hear the voice of his neighbor singing and screaming and drinking. So Abu Hanifa asked, what happened to my neighbor? And they told him that apparently one day he was very depressed or something on the way back. He started to drink before he even got home. So as Shufta, the police, they, they arrested him and they imprisoned him. They sent him to jail. So Abu Hanifa, rahmatullah alayhi, immediately went to the house of the Khalifa at night. And the Khalifa was very pleased you know, to have him and welcomed him and said, No, don't get down from your horse, but walk into my palace with your horse. Which nobody almost did before. And out of respect, he asked Abu Hanifa, What can we do for you? And Imam Abu Hanifa said, I just came for a very simple matter. My neighbor apparently was arrested tonight. And I just came to ask that you release him. The Khalifa was so happy and excited by the visit of Imam Abu Hanifa that he said, Everybody that was in prison tonight is free. And so Imam Abu Hanifa went to his neighbor and picked his neighbor from jail and took him home. And on the way back home he said, Hal ya fata? Have we wasted you? And so subhanAllah now this neighbor knew that Imam Abu Hanifa yani, heard what he was saying and knew about his, uh, his secret. So imagine, yani, immediately that was a reason for tawbah for that man. And he became one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on all. And here we see again how it's not a matter of screaming and shouting and insulting you, kafir, you, fajr, you, this, you, that, you don't know this. But it's that wisdom of da'wah and approaching people in the most beautiful way. يَقُلُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ أُدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمُعِضَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ Advise people, yes, say the truth. But the way you say it and the way you carry it and the way you present it to people has to have a form of wisdom and respect. And what else, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, to conclude the subject of Imam Abu Hanifa than the taqwa of Imam Abu Hanifa? Imam Abu Hanifa was known for his great taqwa, piety, mindfulness, and fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his worship. Abu Hanifa dedicated, and dedication to teaching did not slow him from his worship. But actually, Abu Hanifa, his iman and taqwa drove him to excel in his worship. Abu Hanifa was known for his continuous and dedicated recitation of the Qur'an. And he is one of only four Muslims ever to complete the recitation of the Qur'an inside the Kaaba itself. But the recitation of Abu Hanifa was one that was filled with a mind that reflects and an eye that cries before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why when Khalid wanted to ask Abu Hanifa a question after Isha, he said, I noticed that Abu Hanifa after the Isha prayer was reciting the Qur'an. So I thought I'll wait behind him without disturbing him and ask him my question after he was done with his recitation. Khalid then said that Abu Hanifa recited the verse, فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا فَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ A verse describing the day of judgment and the condition of the fearful Muslims in that state. Khalid said Abu Hanifa continued to recite and repeat the verse over and over until the Adhan of Fajr was called. May Allah bless us with reflecting upon the verses of the Qur'an. In another incident, during Isha prayer, the Imam recited Surah Al-Zalzal, in which Allah says, Whosoever does an atom weight of a good deed on the Day of Judgment will see the fruits of that deed. And whosoever does an atom weight of a bad deed on the Day of Judgment will see the consequences of their wrongdoing. 
Yazid narrated that after all the people left the masjid, only Abu Hanifa stayed in the masjid and was reflecting on those powerful verses of the Qur'an. Yazid mentioned that when he was entering the mosque to deliver the adhan and call for the fajr prayer, he still saw Abu Hanifa in the same place, holding his beard, reflecting on those verses of the Qur'an, whosoever does a good deed. And at them wait, on the Day of Judgment will see the fruits of it. And whosoever does an atom weight of a bad deed, on the Day of Judgment will see the consequences of their wrongdoing. Abu Hanifa sat from Aisha until Fajr, praying to Allah to protect him on the Day of Judgment, seeking refuge from the punishment of Allah, and seeking the mercy of Allah. Yazid narrated that Abu Hanifa in that night prayed Fajr with the same wudu and evolution of Salat al-Aisha. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa spent his nights in prayer, crying before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and due to his long standing in his night prayer, he was called Al-Wathad, the pillar of the masjid. And we're going to do a great injustice to the Imam and the story of this Imam, uh, just because we need to finish those, uh, yeah, the lecture before the time of Aisha, and we will stop at this point, and inshallah, we will move to the next Imam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mercy Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi